The night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. Welcome to another great program. Looking forward to this discussion tonight because we'll be talking with Dr. <laughs> and you've all been <laughs> challenging me to pronounce this first name, but it's not as hard as it looks, actually. It's Taria. We'll be talking with Dr. Taria Simonsen. He's a Norwegian historian of ideas. He's also a nonfiction author. He specializes in the esoteric and the occult, and we'll be talking all about his theories and ideas as it relates to the paranormal community. We'll also talk a lot about the conflict or I guess we'll call it a conflict, the conflict between science and paranormal study. Be sure you've subscribed to our channels. You need to subscribe to the YouTube channel and you need to subscribe to the Twitch channel. If you've got Amazon Prime and you use that to make your subscription on the Twitch channel, there's no charge. It's free. Very cool. <laughs> You're telling me I need to make the trip. Yeah, I don't disagree. So, um, but either channel can be found on either of those platforms by just searching for my name, JV Johnson. Very, very easy to find. Let's go to break. When we come back, we will, in fact, um, get our guest on the phone. Looking forward to the conversation. It's beyond reality. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Joha. That's J-O-H-A-W. Uh, Taria, welcome to Beyond Reality. It's great to have you on tonight. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. Um, uh, first of all, I, I'm not. Are you in Nor Norway now? Is that where you are uh, yes, connecting I, to us from? I, yes, I'm in uh, Mandal, which is a little uh, coastal town uh, in uh, south of Norway. Very interesting. And is it as cold? It's probably about as cold there as it is here in upstate New York. Are, your winters are kind of uh, snowy and and wet and white, aren't they? Uh, yes, not white anymore because there have been some uh, days with, uh, uh, say, uh, plus Celsius degrees. But now we are back in the, in, in the freezing territory. So uh, I yeah. think I think we're going to have our first non-freezing temperature days since um, December in the next two days, and we're really excited about oh. it. So yeah. it, it's always an optimistic yeah. time of year, right? Yeah, it is. So um, before we get talking about you uh, personally and your work, I want to have a, a sense of maybe what um, the Norwegian people or maybe Scandinavia as a whole, the attitudes that prevail about paranormal ideas. Are they similar to what we might see here in the United States? Well, uh, my impression is that, uh, say, scholars and academics, they are quite uh, much the same uh, all over the Western world. Uh, so, but uh, in rural Norway, there's a quite a tradition for, uh, especially for two things, for warm hands, you know, healers, mm -hmm. and also for people, people that can see. And they were quite quite often consulted if uh, people had lost uh, uh, some uh, goat or some sheep, you know, in rural areas. They could go to these people and uh, have them try to use their clairvoyance to get it back. But as I say, in urban and academic Norway, that's uh, no tradition for that anymore. But uh, still, in small, uh, say, rural communities, you will, you will find those kind of people. And when you say warm hands, you mean like healers, like healers that would yeah. use their hands yeah. to heal? Wow. And yes. And that was a, that was pretty common um, throughout history, and, and, and in some cases still is in the smaller communities. Yes, uh, if you read folkloristic literature, uh, ethnography, and that kind of things, you will find uh, quite uh, some uh, say strong personalities with those abilities. And you, if you go back even to the sagas, you know uh, both uh, the Icelandic uh, sagas, uh, but also Norwegian sagas. You will find people uh, that with their touch could heal other people uh, described. We have a lot of people that come on the program that um, talk about having those abilities and those sensitivities. Do you have a name for it? I mean, do you, do you classify it as um, as mystic healers or or some type of spiritual healing? It's uh, you know you can make so uh, lots of classifications. Uh, uh, it's a difficult question, really, because I, I've looked into it uh, and. Uh, you know, some call it uh, vibrational healing, some call it faith healing, some call it energy healing, some call it theta healing after mm -hmm. the brain waves, and so uh, uh, I have somehow concluded that basically uh, what is most important is the intention to heal. Uh, there was a great English healer of uh, 
uh, Norwegian uh, descent, uh, Tom Johansson, and he had even experienced uh, a person that healed other by a trumpet, you know, blowing the healing into them. Uh, so uh, there clearly it was the intention about healing, uh, because, you know, you can also have distant healing and uh, that can then there is no hands laying on at all. So I, I think... Uh, uh, because my, we can get back to that probably, but uh, my basic, uh, say, um, perception or idea about consciousness is, is a non-local phenomenon. So we are all connected in what I call the mental internet. So it's a kind of a communication uh, via this mental internet it is uh, with an intention to heal, which is... Yeah, interesting. And we will talk about that at, uh, at length as we our conversation continues here. Um, let's talk about your introduction to these ideas, though. When did you develop an interest in paranormal topics? Well, you know, every child, uh, I think, is interested in fairy tales. And I was that, uh, of course, uh, I loved uh, reading Norwegian folk tales and also this uh, Arabic, you know, tales that Disney had made films about uh, Aladdin and all that kind of stories. Uh, and also when I become older, I become part of a Christian youth club and uh, some of my friends there told me about strange things. And because I knew them, I had not, uh, not uh, reason to disbelieve what they right. told me. Right. And, and later also uh, people in my family told about strange things. I could give some examples later if you like. And um, my grandfather was an engineer and uh, he could hear my grandmother coming home about half an hour before she actually came. Uh, and uh, that would uh, vary from uh, day to day because she could have met some uh, new people in town now, become, uh, say, uh, held back in some shop or something, you know. So, uh, But he got a strong sense half an hour bef uh, before she was coming home. He could hear uh, her uh, coming in the stairs and uh, opening the door and, uh, you know, with, the, say, the sound of the keys and everything. So it's Norwegian uh, tra uh, tradition. This is called the Vardöger, when you can hear people, uh, say, sometime before they come. So he had that, and he was a, a rational man and, as I said, an engineer, you know. So when he tell, told me that, what could I say? You're lying. I, that was not a possible <laughs> position. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. It, it, okay, so... The phenomena in which your grandfather could hear your grandmother coming home before she actually did. Um, and you say yes. it, it's something common um, for people uh, in Norway. I mean, we have things that we talk about that might be considered like gut feelings or premonitions. Would it be the same thing? Uh, this is more specific, really, because gut feeling is also, uh, in Norway, that would be called Marge Fölse. Marge is a gut or a belly. So, so uh, Vardöger is more specific because that you get very, uh, say, you can hear uh, the sound of the specific car. You can hear the sound of a specific door. They will work if the stair has, uh, say, 10 steps, you can hear um, two, three, four, five, yeah. six, seven, you know, so it's very specific. Uh, and uh, it, there has been done some kind of uh, sociological, uh, say, uh, survey for this. And this phenomenon seemed to be more common in Norway. So one of the great parapsychologists in Norway, professor in biology, Joe Hugen, he uh, wrote a book called uh, Our National Paranormal Phenomenon. And uh, that is a Vardöger. Very interesting. So they'd be like, not necessarily phantom noises, but they would be um, kind of in the, in the, but in the mind's eye, they, they, no one else would hear them, but your grandfather would hear them, right? So they would be that unique a, to him. That is a bit very interesting uh, because uh, you're asking me that uh, my father has passed away so I have not been able to discuss this uh, with him uh, but there were uh, his two sisters uh, the two daughters in the family one of them could hear this but the other did not hear it really so yes hmm. so do you, so is this like psychic ability in the sense that some people are more acutely attuned to it versus others I would say so, yes. It seems to be, say, uh, connected with, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, say, de person-dependent, yes. Wow. So you grew up and you've got family members that have th some of these uh, uh, um, abilities, I guess, or sensitivities, and some of these uh, uh, occurrences and stories are shared with you. And it's so it kind of develops an air about you where you have to be open to these ideas or deny what's going on around you with your family. 
Yes, uh, that's true because, you know, the, uh, people and also it's a very important, they are not the kind of guru type, you know, yeah. wanting to build their egos and, uh, uh, you know, get attention to themselves. They are rather soft-spoken, quiet people, you know, so it's uh, no reason to disbelieve this. Uh, uh, the uh, only thing, uh, say, where there would be room for disbelief that they somehow c- could have misunderstood their perceptions, you know. Right. But the re- report in itself is no doubt to be, uh, disbelief. Did you have any of these experiences yourself or other types of paranormal experiences maybe growing up? Uh, yes, uh, later uh, I, I I become say more in tune to that. It could have been something uh, both with a kind of crisis early in my twenties because then you somehow get in connect uh, connection with the, the deeper layer of the psyche. Also, I started to do meditation, so that could have something to do with it because I have had uh, uh, say a number of experiences myself uh, also. You, you've mentioned already um, uh, something called the mental internet. I think that's probably a, a much of the foundation of the things we're going to talk about tonight. So let's talk about that right now and get an understanding of what you mean when you say the mental internet. Well, you know, uh, if you say what it is not, uh, then uh, the normal, uh, say, conventional idea about uh, consciousness, uh, the academic, scholarly, Western, modern uh, view, is that consciousness is inside your head. Uh, and uh, and inside my head and inside everybody's head. Right. But it's, it's separate. Uh, uh, and if I say to you, Internet is inside my PC or inside my tablet or inside uh, my mobile phone. What do you say then? Uh, you say that is not correct. You say right. that Internet is the network between all PCs, between the tablets, between the mobile phones. So that would be the metaphor here. That uh, my idea of consciousness, which is in fact is a very old idea, I just used it metaphor to, to somehow illustrate it to, to modern folks, uh, that is uh, basically... Uh, uh, consciousness is a collective shared field of information that we ha- are linked up to. So uh, it's like being online. You are online on uh, the mental internet. And uh, if you view consciousness that way, uh, say a phenomenon like telepathy is uh, very reasonable to, to, to somehow be open to because uh, we uh, are already connected so it's not like i am inside my head and trying very very hard to think of you and get inside your head uh, trying to send my talks telepathically it's not that way we are already connected before we are somehow separated in in singular individuals so that is the what they call the mental internet say the basic foundation of consciousness as a collective uh, sphere of information Okay, so just to try to get a little bit of clarification on that concept, are we talking about uh, individual consciousness that's that's but it's connected via some fashion, or are we talking about everyone's part of a greater consciousness? Well, you know, uh, I like the last uh, formulation you gave me for that. Uh, but uh, if uh, I use the metaphor for the internet, I could say my PC, you know, I'm logging on to that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so uh, and then I can download information and can also send emails, you know. And if I download information, that would be clairvoyance, like this guy finding the lost goat or sheep in, in the forest, you know. Uh, then he's uh, going there, he, going to Google Maps, and uh, and searching, you know, uh, and uh, if he send uh, if uh, telepathy, then we'd be like sending an email to a friend or family member. You know, these are just metaphors. But you know, every day we experience non-locality because non-locality is the is the core concept here. Really, uh, uh, we experience non-locality. As I uh, said, uh, a friend in York uh, and a friend in New York, uh, uh, first place in England second place in uh, the US they are just the same distance from you when you are at your PC and that's the same uh, if I for instance would do telepathy to a person uh, in the town next to here or to a friend living in Australia uh, if you go to the mental internet uh, distance is I- irrelevant really so you somehow go in a superposition uh, related to the normal perception of, of space 
Are these obviously the the internet is a relatively new term or new idea? But uh, you know, you're using that as a metaphor. But are these yes. greater ideas new to us? Or I almost get the impression that these are ideas that we understood maybe um, you know millennia ago or, or centuries ago, and then kind of talked ourselves out of them, and now are rediscovering them. I'm. Uh, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so, uh, if you go back to say uh, um, different philosophies, uh, if you go to the alchemists, uh, for instance, they would call it uh, the anima mundi, uh, the world soul. Uh, and uh, if you go to uh, the Indian tradition, they would perhaps call it uh, the akasha. Uh, if you go to the Kabbalah, they could perhaps call it uh, Adam Kadman, the original Adam, say the, the original human being before uh, we were split off, you know. So the, uh, in many kind of languages, in many kind of myths, uh, you have this idea about a collective consciousness being the core, uh, at the core uh, behind all uh, the individual consciousness. So, uh, but as I say, Every day we experience this uh, by just logging on uh, to our PCs. So therefore I use that metaphor. But basically it's a very, very old idea. You wrote a book. It's called A Short History of Nearly Everything Paranormal. Give us a kind of a synopsis of what the book's about and then let's talk about why you wrote it. Oh, it's very long, but uh, I go into the difference. Uh, yes, uh, it's 500 pages. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, 540, really. So uh, I go into the... Di uh, because I got uh, an editor, uh, Pax Publishing in Norway. It's a very scientifically minded uh, publisher. It's not kind of new age public uh, pu publisher. And my editor, she has edited lots of uh, sci scientific uh, literature. Um, and she called her a moderate skeptic. So um, when we were to make this book together, you know, uh, I'm basically more say, open to these phenomena than uh, she is. Uh, but we had a very good uh, connection on the personal level. So somehow the book was a cooperation. Uh, so what I did then was to use the different sciences in my uh, problems. So I go, for instance, to uh, famous uh, cases from history. I go to famous cases from archaeology, where clairvoyants have been used to make spectacular finds. I go to anthropology, where anthropologists go to indigenous people and have stunning experiences with shamans and medicine uh, uh, men and, uh, and women. Uh, I go to, for instance, to psychologists doing uh, laboratory research, uh, on psychic phenomena. I go to quantum physicists, uh, a couple of Nobel Prize winners, uh, having themselves experienced uh, paranormal uh, phenomena and also trying to give models from physics and this. So uh, I use a wide spectrum of sciences in my approach. So say each chapter basically is um, one chapter for history, one chapter for anthropology uh, and so on. So that is uh, try to, to, to use uh, uh, because, you know, if you have a scientist, usually that person is a person that is quite good both in observation and in thinking. Uh, I would think it's fair to say above average normal. So people tend to respect scientists a bit more, uh, <laughs> even if they shouldn't always. Uh, they <laughs> tend to do that. Yeah. So I, I have used that, uh, say, positive uh, uh, pre uh, uh, what is called uh, prejudice about scientists as a kind of uh, uh, what is what you say a kind of argument to listen carefully to to what they have to say this is not spinners of yarns and uh, raconteurs you know that are, uh, these are serious people so so that is my basic uh, say approach in the book Let's talk about the relationship between scientists and paranormal ideas, uh, because there seems to be, for the most part, a bit of an adversarial relationship. Is that what you found? Uh, statistically, yes. But as I said, I found some stellar scientists being really into this, and some of them uh, even uh, tell about having paranormal experience themselves. Uh, quite famous uh, quantum physicist Wolfgang Pauli, for instance, he was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics, I think it was 1945, and he was nominated for the prize by a no less grandee than Albert Einstein. So uh, Wolfgang Pauli, he himself had lots of psychokinetic experience when he felt 
about something built up inside him, and suddenly there will happen something strange phenomena around him. Uh, a vase, for instance, could burst. Uh, a, mo- a motor could, uh, you know, just snap, uh, having always functioned. As a chair could just uh, crack, you know. Uh, so he experienced that time after time after time. So he tried to make some kind of explanatory models for these phenomena, and he even wrote a book together with the famous uh, psychiatrist and psychologist and mystic uh, uh, Carl Gustav Jung. So they uh, wrote a book about, uh, say, uh, the combined uh, psychology and and, and physics, uh, how to explain, among other things, these phenomena. So, so, and today we have in uh, Cambridge University, which, as you probably know, is one of the uh, highest ranked universities in the world. I think it's number four or five in in the world, really. And there we have Professor Brian Josephson, and he has, uh, he's emeritus now, he, he's uh, retired, but he won the Nobel Prize in Physics in uh, 1973. And uh, he also uh, claimed to have, have uh, both telepathy and the psychokinesis demonstrated to him. So you have those kinds. So I report quite a lot of uh, these phenomena. Uh, and so there's not just weak-minded uh, scientists having taken LSD or something. There's really top-notch scientists telling about these phenomena. Now, it seems that as though in, in antiquity here, maybe, um, you know, 100 years ago, uh, we did have a lot of very mainstream scientists and inventors, people like Thomas Edison or Nikola Tesla, yes. were very interested in these ideas and actually did a lot of work on trying to get answers. And as you pointed out, um, Einstein and others, some of our the fathers uh, of our modern scientific thought were really invested in, it, in these ideas. And at some point, the science community drifted apart from it. Um, but it seems as though as we make progress in understanding quantum sciences and some of these other uh, concepts, we're starting to find maybe closer connections to these things than maybe some scientists wanted to admit. Yes, it seems so. Uh, Dean Radin, as you probably know, he's the most uh, famous parapsychologist today, and he has been arranging conferences uh, uh, under the umbrella of the National Academy of Science in the U.S., and that's quite quite mainstream science. So, uh, and also in 2006, and I think also later, uh, the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science uh, have a conference where there were a psi uh, as a paranormal researchers uh, together with uh, physicists trying to uh, look at time and precognition and uh, uh, what they call a retro causality that somehow uh, the twisting of the relationship between cause and effect which somehow make it possible perhaps to to say something about the future and that was a conference as I said arranged in 2006 and they also made a book uh, uh, the proceedings afterwards so uh, yes uh, it, there is what kind of uh, uh, what is called a kind of careful approach between uh, the these uh, camps as we explore things um like uh, we had a, a a scientist on the program last week who was talking about um the ideas that can lead to interstellar travel things like bending space and time um yes. and and bending the fabric of of what we what we consider to be space and you know some scientists say space is nothingness but other scientists say actually space has a, has a connect, connectivity to it and it's related to gravity and it's related to magnetism etc cetera, etc cetera. is this collective consciousness or this fabric that we call the uh minds internet or the mental internet is that something similar to that or is it even part of that uh, I discussed that uh, in my book. You know, there's a good model you give there. Uh, um, uh, my focus, because uh, I'm not a physicist, so I should not pretend to be one. And uh, my focus is really on the phenomena mm-hmm. themselves. Okay. Uh, as lo- as long uh, as long as they happen, and I have no reason to be disbelieve that. As I say, if you take a statistical survey, uh, more than half of people will tell about uh, having experienced, say, telepathy, clairvoyance, or that kind of phenomena. So as long as those reports are in 
in millions. Uh, that is my main concern. And then it's up to the good physicists to give us the explanatory models that can make us understand that. And what you just mentioned could be a good model for that. Uh, I discuss other models also. I discuss about five models, uh, possible models to explain uh, the telepathy in my, in my book. Um, uh, so, but the uh, problem is if you fall in love with one model, uh, then suddenly it can happen that that model uh, falls out of fashion and th then you have a problem because you have somehow invested, uh, say, the reliability uh, of the existence of these phenomena to that particular model. And uh, I will not say one uh, evil word about him, but uh, the great uh, both physicist and, and mystic, I uh, prefer to call him that, I think, Fritjof Capra, he uh, wrote his famous book early in the 70s, uh, Phys uh, Tao of Physics, and he found uh, close connections uh, between uh, quantum physics and Eastern mysticism. Uh, but he made some one kind of, say, misstep there because he was uh, adherent to a model in quantum physics called the bootstrap theory. And that theory fall out of fashion. And then the skeptic would say, oh, ha, 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 look here. Right. No, he is, uh, yes, uh, on the garbage dump with his theories. So, uh, but as I said, my, uh, my focus is the phenomenon uh, because people report them and you have uh, uh, statistics will tell you there are millions of reports of those phenomena. So uh, I suggest five different models, uh, and but I also say perhaps these models are not right. But as long as the phenomena uh, continue to occur, that is uh, the most important really. Uh, and uh, uh, probably, you know, also a classical natural science is in deep uh, <laughs> trouble in some way because as you probably know, uh, the connection between quantum physics and uh, theory of uh, relativity is not uh, good, you know, because as you said, uh, theory of relativity has gravity as a very central component, mm -hmm. but uh, in, in quantum physics, uh, they um, have no, uh, say, place for gravity. Uh, so that is very strange, really, and that's a, a kind of a dirty little secret most sci and many scientists will not tell you. Uh, and then you have this uh, so-called string theory or M theory that try to say unify those, uh, uh, say, making it totally other ideas about um, particles and, and that kind of things. So, uh, um, so it cannot be demanded from parapsychology to give, a, say, a, a total explanatory model for these phenomena as long as, say, normal physics had not agreed on, yeah, say, are there, is there dark matter or is there not? Most physicists will say there uh, about 70% of the universe could consist of dark matter. But there are also uh, a minority, a very well-educated minority, that says, no, we don't need uh, dark matter at all to, uh, to explain, uh, say, the physical phenomena we can observe. So, as I said, uh, the models, uh, even if I suggest five different models for consciousness, uh, which somehow relates to what you you, you you started here with uh, the models in themselves are not my main focus when we get back to public perception and the scientific community as a whole's perception not individual scientists that may accept some of these ideas but just in in general academia science community we we've seen and, and i'm assuming you've had some of the same uh, experiences in norway or wherever else you've done your study but um uh, television in particular has has accepted, in fact, embraced uh, these paranormal reality television shows. I was involved with one for quite some time, um, and they've they've changed public perception about a lot of different ideas. Plus, you know, we get we get movies from Hollywood and other mu movie production facilities that either glorify or you know pre present in a scary way some of these ideas. How does all of that affect what you see? In this, in this uh, effort to uh, understand and also get some acceptance of these ideas? A very good question. Uh, these programs uh, are also quite popular in Norway. One of them uh, was quite, in fact, some years ago, the most popular uh, program in Norway at all. So, um, uh, and they... Um, 
Uh, what can I say? Uh, they have have very good. Uh, the guy who is running those programs in Norway, he is quite. Uh, he is basically a skeptic, so he has kind of a, what you could say a, a down to earth approach, and I think that's good. So he has uh, succeeded in gaining some kind of say general. Uh, accept uh, at least uh, slash fascination about this and also that you are not uh, uh, crazy if you talk about this phenomenon. Uh, still, the academics are uh, trying to debunk uh, these uh, things. Uh, they also, you know, they're kind of, uh, I, I don't think anybody knows about it, but he, his name is Anders Wahl and he is a, a physicist and he, you know, uh, have programs and uh, television trying to debunk these phenomena and also uh, how can you get a natural explanation of what uh, really happened and, and that kind of things but basically yes the, so that is very positive because the uh, uh, what they do is say interview say normal people having kind of extraordinary experiences and uh, even in one of those programs that uh, they caught on camera uh, I was quite uh, <laughs> happily surprised then because because uh, they were in a kitchen where there were lots of kind of psychokinetic phenomena reported, you know, uh, vases and dishes moving and all that. And suddenly, when uh, they were on location, uh, a, a host of uh, knives and forks were bursting out of a uh, drawer. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. So uh, that was quite uh, impressive, really. So uh, that is very positive. But, but what I do not like about those programs, it's some of them tend to focus on the say ghost stories and yeah. the dark aspects yes so uh, there's a plus and minus about these things the, the, the plus side is uh, creating openness but the other is somehow just do kind of uh, say um, I will not say satanic but you know trying to somehow taint these things in a dark manner mm -hmm. uh, whereas my idea about this is this really is our birth rate uh, uh, birth rights and uh, our human heritage uh, and it's not basically something you should be you should have respect for but not to be scared of well, okay, so how common do you think these uh, psi abilities, things like telepathy, um, are in, throughout the population? Because I certainly don't feel like I've got those sensitivities, and maybe I just haven't recognized them. Yes, you haven't recognized them. Uh, that is the, uh, and but if uh, you have an uncle and you love very much, and he suddenly uh, is uh, getting a heart attack, and you suddenly feel uh, in another city, you also feel a kind of pain in the chest at the same time. Then you would have that kind of experience, and that is very common, you know. Uh, and people do not think of themselves as being very paranormal on occult or any. At, uh, that. But if a close relative uh, suddenly ha is in pain, then will some feels that something is not right, even if they're not physically present. That's very, very common. I could give so many examples. And also this kind of phenomena that uh, the English biologist uh, Rupert Sheldrake had called tel uh, 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 telephone uh, uh, telepathy. Uh, for instance, you got a feeling that you should call uh, Richard, uh, your good friend, that you you were studying together with five years ago and you're thinking Richard and you're reaching out for the phone and suddenly it's ringing and then it, there is Richard <laughs> and it could be two years, three years since your last time I have heard anything from him. Uh, that is a, a quite common experience and uh, in fact uh, Rupert Sheldrake, he did experiment uh, with that and uh, he gave a, a mobile phone to four friends of, uh, they say, uh, the experiment person. And then one uh, of these four friends should call that person. And before he or she was taking up the phone, he or she should guess who of the four friends is calling. And since it's four friends, you should give uh, one out of four chance that uh, uh, you would get, get, uh, have a right guess. But in fact, it was much more. It, I think it was uh, it not, uh, say one out of four is 25 percent. I think it was about uh, 36 or 37 uh, percent right, you know. And that has been done not only by Rupert Sheldrake, but also at the universities in uh, Amsterdam and University of Freiburg in Germany. So. Uh, in fact, 
or that was normal people, not uh, say uh, mystics or gurus or so. So if you participated in that experiment, I suggest you also would get more than twenty five percent hit. So are you basically one of the things that you're saying here is that we all experience these things. We just in some cases may not recognize that's what we're experiencing. For example, um, you know, I may have, as you, in the scenario that you described, I may have a, a pain somewhere that's in sympathy with a relative or someone I care about. Um, and, but not recognize that relationship, not recognize that's why I have it. I just, just, you know, ignore it and go on about my day. Yes, I think that could be quite uh, common. And uh, th th some of say some of the family stories. Uh, just to give you my uh, example, my uncle and aunt they were uh, laying in bed, uh, going to sleep, and my uncle he had uh, gone to sleep. Um, and my aunt, she was uh, reading a history book. Uh, it was a, a, a Swedish history book, a quite famous work called Greenberg's Historia. And there was some kind of uh, uh, Egyptian uh, photograph with some, uh, say, text under. And she was reading uh, the text, you know. And my uncle was sound asleep uh, beside her. And suddenly, when she was uh, reading that text, uh, my uncle started speaking in his sleep. And the words he was saying was the exact same word she was reading from the book. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and that was a kind of, uh, at least in my perception, that a kind of spontaneous telepathy, you know, because he is in his sleep, uh, his God is stone, and he is perceiving uh, his uh, loved uh, wife, what she is reading. And uh, so uh, they are not, uh, they are passed away now many years ago, both of them, but uh, they were not considering themselves to be any kind of gifted in this respect at all. It's just a uh, kind of strange phenomenon. And my aunt had also other phenomena of the same kind. So it's just, it was not just kind of a singular experience. Some people make a connection between parapsychology and these paranormal phenomena and occultism. Is there a connection or are they something very different? Uh, there could be a connection because in the, the occult traditions, they have, as you said, uh, many people experience these phenomena, but they don't uh, register them really. Uh, but in occult tradition, uh, they s sought to cultivate them and, of course, therefore become very uh, much more aware of them. And also in occult tradition, you tend to do meditations and uh, rituals, and uh, even uh, in some uh, orders, you also do psychedelics and all that can open to more of these kind of experiences. So there is a connection, but as I said, in my perception, these are very, very natural phenomena that we all have. I compare them with musicality. Uh, and uh, say, uh, all of us are, uh, have some kind of musicality, uh, but someone can become professional musicians, uh, but uh, someone should uh, limit themselves just to sing in the shower. And some can go on and become Pavarotti or famous uh, uh, composer or whatever, you know. So uh, the talent is there, uh, uh, but the degree uh, of it is very, very, uh, there's a very, say, big scale there from zero, almost zero to two, two. Yeah, I, how far can you go, really? So, so, but as I said, natural phenomenon uh, that you can cultivate by techniques. But someone, people, even if you know, start taking musical classes, you will probably, I don't know you, but I uh, expect uh, never you will become a Beethoven or, or, or uh, Jimi Hendrix or something. Uh, so some people are exceptionally gifted from the outside, but uh, within your own limits, you can develop uh, your musicality. And I think it's also possible to, so to some extent, to develop your sensitivity to, to these phenomena. And how does somebody do that? Is that is it something where they have to, first of all, I would suppose in my case, it would have to be to open myself up to it a little bit more and pay attention to some of the smaller things that are happening throughout my day that may have that connection. But secondly, do you is, is it a meditating process? You say you, you, things started to happen for you when you started meditating, um, among yes. other things. Uh, so uh, are those uh, some uh, of the things? Yes, I, I would say so. Uh, paying attention is the first. Uh, I, uh, I would say that uh, my last chapter uh, in my book, uh, chapter nine, is called Our Paranormal Daily Life. And there I also give a crash 
course in how to develop these abilities within yourself. And uh, the most simple exercise is just start uh, active guessing. If you get, uh, um, say, you get an email uh, before you have opened it for a friend, uh, what does he or she want with that mail? Or if you get a letter in the post, what, uh, who is sending that letter and what do they want? And uh, if you are watching baseball, who will win the game tonight? Uh, and so, and if you're going on holiday, uh, how will it look like uh, before uh, that will be after the corona pandemic? <laughs> but uh, uh, how, how will it look like where we are, are going on our, our uh, vacation? So try to active guess and, and uh, evaluate your guess. Uh, that will be a very good start because then you will start to pay attention. And uh, it would be a good thing to start guessing what you could not know. Uh, so say, uh, put yourself after, take the risk, you know, and you will do lots and lots of mistakes. But uh, the, say uh, the esoteric masters will tell you that uh, you have to develop the feel for it. And suddenly you get this gut feeling. Ha, huh, no, I, I really uh, know who is calling and so. So you can start doing that. And you can also start doing meditation. The kind of spiritual discipline is always good for uh, both for the mental balance, but also to, to develop general sensitivity uh, to, towards uh, this field. And there are courses. I will not do kind of add for any specific courses, uh, but... Um, well, I could mention the most popular is probably what they call silver course. Uh, there uh, you, uh, are, as I said, I not tried that myself, but I know some of the a couple of the psychics practicing in, in Norway uh, have told me that they had uh, say benefit from uh, silver courses, and also uh, you could use um, these uh, CDs or no, you probably get them as files. Um, uh, be neural beats uh, then. Uh, brain entrainment you uh, by using these cds i use the cds then um you can somehow change gears uh, in the, your brainwave pattern and then you also can become more con uh, conscious about what's going on uh, in uh, in this uh, uh, say field so so there are lots of techniques you can use and uh, what many have told me also after personal crisis uh, they have say uh, divorce or a uh, relative uh, had died or even having a near-death experience themselves, they suddenly find themselves much more sensitive to these. Uh, I will not, of course, recommend uh, that kind of things, but uh, if you live your life, you will most of us will experience deep crisis sooner or later by that kind of losing relatives or something like that. That can also uh, tend to develop these uh, abilities, yes. Yeah, I was going to mention uh, near-death experiences because I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody on the program who is a practicing psychic or uh, some type of sensitive in another way, and they often say their their, their journey started after a near-death experience. Have, do you know, have any idea or a theories on why that is the case? Yes, uh, one of my chapters, uh, it's called uh, Consciousness, uh, the uh, Enigmatic Solutions to the Enigmas. And uh, the model of consciousness, uh, I use this uh, American psychiatrist at Virgi Virginia University, uh, uh, the, a couple, in fact, uh, uh, Kelly, his name is Edward Kelly, I don't remember his wife and colleague's name, but uh, also Kelly. They have uh, written a beautiful book called Irreducible Mind, and, and they have uh, kind of, uh, it's a long, uh, say, prehistory for that uh, book also, but um, they launch what, what you could say a filter theory about consciousness, that um, the brain is not what creates consciousness, rather it is what, say, reduces consciousness. If we go back to the mental internet, um, uh, of course, I have my PC and I can download information from the net, but I don't I do not download all the internet to my PC. That would totally destroy my PC and uh, yeah, overwhelm. So, and so it is also with this uh, collective sphere of consciousness that my 
own individual consciousness is connected to. I cannot download every information in this collective field. I would be psychotic immediately. Uh, so I filter out uh, much of the material. And that is uh, to live a normal, say, harmonious, uh, to some extent, a daily life. I, I have to do that. We all have to do that. But if you have a near-death experience uh, or a crisis, uh, or even uh, you can uh, get a kind of brain damage, uh, then suddenly this filter function can be shut off. And then you will be open to these phenomena. Uh, I will give you one example. I talked to a lady. She was not uh, psychic at all. She was kind of a happy-go-lucky lady, out of to- uh, out, uh, going out uh, party girl uh, type. And suddenly she was involved in a car crash. And I think she was clinically dead for 11 minutes. And when she came back, she suddenly found herself being psychic, being able to read the minds of people at the, uh, uh, other people in the room. And she was totally confused because, uh, you know, it's like listening to seven radio stations at once, you know. And uh, what is my th- thought process? What is the doctor's thought process? What is the nurse's thought process? It's very chaotic. So she had to really learn to sort these things. But no, she is uh, working as a full-time psychic. She has learned to, to say, sort the different radio stations. So, um, b- but uh, as I said, b- the different crises can shut down the filter and then you open the floodgates for better and for worse uh, sometimes uh, to, to this collective field of information. You know, you mentioned ghosts, um, you know, as part of this cacophony of paranormal discussions and ideas, particularly on television. Um, But what are your thoughts as it relates to the afterlife and spirit activity uh, in terms of, uh, you know, this mental Internet that you're talking about? It's a very good question. And uh, uh, I I should... uh, I wished I could give you, uh, say, clear-cut answers that uh, I cannot do that. Uh, But uh, I am open to that consciousness uh, if it's uh, not... uh, consciousness is not identical with the brain. Uh, uh, and I, in my last chapter, I also uh, uh, discussed that uh, if you take a reincarnation, for instance, uh, I discussed that under the heading, is it possible to continue blogging with a new PC when the old one breaks? And uh, I go into the science about this because there was uh, also a psychiatrist uh, at uh, Virginia University, this was Canadian, Ian Stevenson, and he has research cases, you probably heard about several of them. And today his, uh, his uh, what is called, he, there is uh, Jim Tucker have taken over this uh, relay button from Ian Stevenson. And there are so many cases where children tell about uh, uh, living earlier life, you know, and right. you can go to... Yeah, you can go to this town they tell about and you will find uh, old people perhaps uh, confirming their stories or you can go to the city archive and uh, you will find that in 1942 there was in fact a guy who went to France and uh, died in operation there and he had uh, was uh, say engaged to a girl named this and this and that. So these stories are abound and you can get many of them confirmed and that could of course indicate that uh, uh, if a child tell that story that could indicate that the child could be a reincarnation of that person that could clearly indicate that but of course if that information uh, is uh, available uh, on the mental internet uh, as you asked me if i go to youtube and see a video with elvis presley uh, and i hear him singing and dancing and he tells about his next concert and so and i go to a friend of mine and I tell him yes i saw uh, elvis doing this and telling that and singing that song and so you know that does not make me an incarnation of Elvis Presley Uh, even if I download the information about Elvis being on the net it does not turn me into an incarnation of that so that child could be an incarnation of that specific person but the child could also be very sensitive for that information 
being on the mental internet and the child could spontaneously download that information. So that's a two ex possible explanations for that uh, phenomenon. One is reincarnation that, uh, and the other is kind of clairvoyant download of the information. And, uh, and in one case, it could be uh, the, the one uh, phenomenon and in other case could be the other. And it's very, very difficult to differentiate that. If I should elaborate just a bit, some of these children have birthmarks. Uh, there would be, for instance, children telling uh, uh, to have been shot uh, at the left side of the head. And you can see in some of these children telling about that kind of dramatic stories, there will be birthmarks resembling the story very closely. Uh, and if um, uh, I think Bush uh, uh, Jim Tucker said that in about 20% of the stories, reincarnation stories, there are also birthmarks somehow say indicating uh, that this story could be more than just downloading of information. Uh, so uh, if you have a, ch a child with a kind of clear birthmark some su uh, substantiating the story, that could of course be uh, say a case of reincarnation. But we all understand that it's very difficult to make kind of clear-cut conclusions on, on, on this matter. It is. It's. It is difficult, and uh, but it's such a, an amazing phenomena. Uh, either way, um, it is. Let's talk about dangers. Are there any dangers for people either working with people who have uh, heightened sensibilities when it comes to these paranormal phenomena, or even doing, uh, you know, engaging in some of them yourself? Is it dangerous in any way? Uh, well. If you expand your horizon, uh, I used the example, if you move from a little rural town uh, in uh, Arkansas and move to New York, there are probably danger in New York that are not present in Arkansas, uh, in this little town you come from. And so if you expand your horizon, there will be dangers, there will be. But also, that is also a part of growing up from being a child, you know, to, to somehow take possession of your life and your body and living your grown-up life, there are dangers there that a child in the care of sound parents do not have. Uh, so, uh, but uh, if the dangers are not, uh, and also, as I said, uh, for instance, this lady I told you about having this near-death experience after a car crash, mm -hmm. she was very confused about being suddenly become clairvoyant. And uh, I have discussed this with... Uh, for instance, I, a psychic advisor I consult from time to time, she tells me it's difficult for her to go in, in the shop uh, if there are many people there, because uh, if there are five people in the cube uh, in front of her, she will start, suddenly start getting in five different li life stories, you know. <laughs> so it can be quite chaotic. Uh, and in Norwegian folk tradition, uh, it's sometimes uh, considered a, a curse more than a blessing to have these abilities, because uh, if, for instance, you see a peop uh, person uh, having kind of illness, you know, uh, what should you do? Should you scare uh, sh shit out of him? Go and tell, I see you're ill, you could die. You must go to the doctor, you know. Uh, and uh, you, you you could scare him uh, unnecessarily, or he could just think you're crazy, you know. So uh, too much information can be a burden. And, uh, and so that is, say, kind of uh, the dark side of being sensitive uh, that you can have to deal with. Uh, and also if you are in a party and uh, everybody is happy, but you are not happy because you feel, uh, say, uh, some of the falseness about it all, you know, and the superficiality you feel much more uh, present to you uh, than the other person's present, perhaps. But uh, say the occult thing or so, that is a double-edged sword uh, because uh, you should care very much about intention uh, go, uh, going into that because if your intention... Um, there is a, an occult order that I like. Uh, there are many I do not like. One I like, it's called Servants of the Light. Uh, and uh, then you have to, before you get initiated, you have to uh, uh, declare, I know, uh, I want to know in order to serve. 
uh, to serve the light then. Uh, and uh, so if you want to go into this field, you should have good intentions. You should have intentions about being at service to other people, uh, uh, perhaps develop healing abilities or using your clairvoyant abilities to, to counsel, to help people get the best out of their life. You should always have good intentions with what you do. And I think as long as you have good intention, they will work as a talisman for you. It will protect you against negative vibes in this field. But if you go in there to have power, uh, you know, and to manipulate people and uh, being the big guru and all that stuff, then you are in danger. You ego, if you succeed, if developed and taking, say, some kind of psychedelics and becoming uh, a bit uh, telepathic, perhaps, or something, and your ego swells, you know, and I'm this big guru and all that stuff, you know. So that could destroy you. So as I said, uh, the Buddha said, intention, intention, intention. So to, uh, if you have good intention, that will protect you and uh, you will be safe. If you not have good intentions, you probably should do some other thing. Frequently, when I talk to people on the program, particularly psychics or other empaths or sensitive folks, um, you know, I often say, uh, you know, why do you think you have these abilities to a heightened degree versus somebody else? And often an answer will be something like, well, I'm part Native American. What is it about indigenous people? Is there really a connection there? And um, if so, what, what, what is it about indigenous people that gives them an additional sensitivity? Uh, it's a two thing. I think you have given the answer early in the program. Uh, you said, if I want, uh, you said about yourself uh, that if you wanted to develop these abilities, uh, then I should perhaps start to become more aware of them. Uh, and that uh, is some of the secret. I think indigenous people have very often a tradition for being aware of these phenomena. We have that also in Norway. You know, north in Norway, you have the Sami people. Uh, they the earlier called Laplanders, but they prefer to be called Sami. Um, and they have a very long and strong tradition for these uh, uh, phenomena. So if you say that you could feel that, that your uh, grandfather died uh, he, he, at the second he died, even if you were in another city, they will not laugh of you. They will say, oh, yes, uh, of course you could. Uh, so if you cultivate a culture that will somehow register these phenomena and not dismiss it when they appear, of course, uh, that will be part of the secret to open up to more of them. The other thing is, if there are people still living the indigenous life, uh, uh, not, uh, of course, we have lots of Sami people living in uh, the cities today, but s some of them are still out on uh, the, 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 you know, the, I don't know what they call it in, uh, in American, but Vidda in a Norwegian, that will be a snow-covered tundra, you know, where they have reindeers and so. And uh, if uh, you are out there, under the starry night and it's completely silent you know not a car honk right. not a radio uh, not uh, any party going on it's just you and the snow and the stars of course you will become more sensitive to every kind of vibes so uh, as i said the tradition to taking care of these phenomena and also in some cases uh, a more say uh, quiet lifestyle. Uh, both these things will be uh, make you uh, predisposed to be, say, a bit more psychic than the average person. So, is it is it? Am I jumping to a conclusion here when I say it's a more of a cultural advantage than it is maybe a genetic advantage? <sighs> It's uh, difficult to say, uh, but as I found this phenomena, you, uh, you mentioned the Native Americans. Uh, they have a very strong uh, culture for that. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken with Canadian, um, uh, say, uh, First Nations people, very strong culture for that. Uh, I've spoken with Sami people, very strong cultures from, from that. I've speak, spoken with African people, strong culture for it. I've spoken with Jamaican people, strong culture for, for it, and so and so. You fin uh, uh, find it in every indigenous culture it seems more or less uh, so if it has been a genetic thing uh, well it, it seems to be a, say a common human phenomenon and musicality is that genetic or culture basically it's genetic but also 
it's a cultural thing. I think it will have uh, make it uh, what it, uh, <laughs> you know, I losing the words. I'm a free sex use me. I'm speaking not my native language. <laughs> uh, it's it's both. It's both genetic and cultural. You have genetic that we all are psychic basically, and you have cultures. Some are. Most indigenous cultures are open to it, and some culture it. And uh, if you have long uh, old cultures, say the Indian and Chinese culture, you have uh, highly uh, elaborate systems like uh, yoga, for instance. Uh, uh, you l- really learn to to somehow develop these the kind of things. So basic genetics, yes, and also uh, uh, cultural, uh, yeah. You, your book is called A Short History of Nearly Everything Paranormal. We, of course, recommend that. But do you have other books that you recommend that people would find interesting and useful in this uh, in exploring these ideas? <sighs> Yes, uh, there are other books. It depends on what people are interested in. Uh, but uh, I, I like the books of Dean Radin uh, because there's so much mumbo-jumbo out there. But Dean uh, Radin, he's very modest. He's probably the best, uh, I would not say, there are many great parapsychologists, but he's at least one of the best parapsychologists out there. And his books are humorous and they are reliable. So uh, I uh, quote uh, Dean Radin uh, uh, quite a lot in my book, but of course, uh, with the said uh, something about my, my book, um, it's uh, bigger than the Dean Radin's book. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, Dean Radin is a serious scientist. Uh, he is a natural scientist, also he is a psychologist, but he do lots of laboratory research. Uh, I'm more a historian, you know, and I give um, my approach is a bit more say common cultural uh, so uh, if you but i will recommend uh, you should read my book and dean radin's books then you uh, have very good overview over this field where can people find your book uh, they could go to amazon for instance uh Tyre simonson a short history of nearly everything paranormal or they could go to barnes and noble or they could go to walmart even or to powell's or every kind of uh, serious web uh, big web store will have it and i need you to say your name again because i've obviously been saying it wrong <laughs> yes, uh, t- uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Taria, that's first name. Okay. Taria, that's a Norwe- yes, a Norwegian name. And uh, I have not yet met a person that uh, will uh, make it right on first uh, try. So you are in a very good uh, company here. <laughs> well, I was, yes. I, it was said to me phonetically as well, and apparently that didn't do the job either. But either way, it's been a fascinating it, discussion. I really appreciate your time um, and your willingness to share all of this because it was it's your work is quite good and your perspective is is even better. So thank you so much for doing this. Thanks a lot for having me on. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.